Welcome back to the football room. We got a jam-packed episode uh, for you guys today. We're breaking down the top quarterbacks in the 2025 draft class and then doing a preview of the Big Ten. Joined by my co-host, Ryan Roberts. Good to be back. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, girls have a little bit of jet lag from our week in Scotland, but otherwise, you know, we're uh, we're just chilling, man. We're only a couple days away from college football, which is awesome. How's everything for you? Uh, it's, you know, it was rough with COVID, but, uh, getting back yeah. to full strength and, uh, yeah, man, excited for the season to start. It's, uh, every year seems like it's an especially long wait, but this summer has been, uh, pretty long, especially considering I'm not that interested in the Olympics outside of basketball. So I haven't had much sports content to consume. Well, well I, I, I've seen that you've been putting in the work though, man, the, uh, the breakdown that you just did on the, the, the defensive line pressures yeah. versus, what move they're taking and their win rates and all that type of stuff, dude. I just, I want to shout you out because I retweeted it because I, I loved it, but like you're, you're grinding, man, you're grinding out there right hey, now. It's NFL, <laughs> NFL pro is uh, changing the game for me. So, yeah. um, but uh, we're going to start out with looking at the 2025 quarterback class and um going to going to start with the top guys which we've kind of identified just based on like consensus how they're viewed as Carson Beck, Shadur Sanders and um also throwing Drew Aller in there. Um yep. so we talked on uh Beck and I think Connor Wigman a little bit uh in our first episode so we can be a little bit more brief on those guys but uh what grade did you have on Carson Beck and uh how do you see him as a prospect? Yeah, I put a late one on them, James. And like when, when I grade, especially in the summer, it's more in a vacuum because we need to remember that positional value is always a thing that's going to be picked up a lot in these conversations, right? You know, quarterback, left tackle, pass rusher, wide receiver, corner. Like there's some positions that are premium positions in the NFL right now that are always going to be bumped up. So like if we're talking about a late first round grade, that's basically me saying that I think Carson Beck has a chance to go very high in the 2025 NFL draft overall. I would say this, though, is that he is my top-ranked quarterback right now, but it's not a slam dunk that I think some people are kind of portraying it as, in my opinion, anyway. Like, I do think that there's a couple quarterbacks that I that could be in that conversation long-term. I think the big thing about, about Beck right now for me, and I don't know if you see this similarly, is I think he has the highest floor in the class. I do question yeah. the ceiling. I, I don't know if we're watching a perennial all pro quarterback when we watch Georgia play, but I do think that we're watching a starting quarterback in the NFL and probably a good starting quarterback in the NFL. So I think this is a conversation over floor versus ceiling because I do think there's a couple guys that have a higher ceiling than Beck, but I just think that I'm, I'm much more comfortable with Carson Beck than I am with a few other guys in this class right now. Yeah, I feel a lot of similar ways about Carson Beck as I do to uh, Will Campbell, the tackle out of LSU, who I know, you don't like have a, an undrafted grade on him, um, <laughs> but it's it's kind of like they're my my number one player at the position, and it, but I'm just sort of waiting for somebody else to overtake them. They're like the stand-in yeah. number one, and um, you know if if Carson Beck ends up being QB one and doesn't show any uh, major improvement next year, then it it might end up being a pretty disappointing quarterback class. But there's always those guys that come out of nowhere and. Um, you know, definitely vulnerable to having his his top spot taken. The biggest limitation to his ceiling that I saw was just uh, playing under pressure, and I don't think he's a great athlete. So some of those are kind of set in stone limits. He's not going to magically start running a four uh, four, right. but just really efficient uh, throws over the middle of the field. Good anticipation, accuracy um, has I would think a a good arm by NFL standards. So. Definitely a lot to like with Carson Beck. Um, we said, are we saying uh, Shadur Sanders as the second quarterback? I, like so, he's he's not for me, but just right. just kind of going based off of consensus, I think is is probably. I I think this is a combination of media versus NFL conversation with Shador because I'll, I'll say it like this: it's very mixed in the media space, right? If we're talking about people that are just mainstream NFL draft analysts or people that do this for a living. Some people really like Shooter Sanders. Some people don't love Shooter Sanders as a prospect. And I don't feel like there's a ton of middle ground right now. Like, I think either you really like him or you have large concerns about him, right? Like, I just don't see a huge middle ground in the media space right now. But I would say this is, you know, just talking to 
some scouting friends in the NFL side of things, some people that I know that are in the know. The NFL does like Shooter Sanders a lot, right? So, like, there is legitimate first-round, high-level conversation over Shador in the NFL side of things. So, I think that it's almost by default right now as far as, like, a consensus conversation because, I mean, I we've talked about Jackson Dart a little bit, right? We've texted about Jackson Dart a little bit. I like Jackson Dart more than, I think, a lot of people in this space. But there is still a conversation of... Is Jackson Dart right now a bona fide first round player? Probably not, right? Some people are going to like others like Connor Wigman. And and I totally get the Connor Wigman thing. And I'm sure that we'll talk about that. But Connor Wigman has only played nine football games, right? So like there is a there is a risk to buying into Connor Wigman right now, comparative to some others that do have a larger sample size. But I will say if we're combining just a lot of what some people in the media think it to be true and what the NFL thinks. I do think there's a lot of Shador Sanders fans. Now, that being said, though, I feel like we're on a similar-ish wavelength as far as, like, I have a a late second-round grade on Shador Sanders. I don't dislike him necessarily, but I also see the limitations, right, where I question if if the ceiling is what people are trying to make it out to be. But I just, I don't know, man. I just feel like it's almost by default because there's some guys that we hope could make that ascension, some guys we're betting on from a summer scouting perspective. But I don't know if there's a guy right now that I look at and say, that is a clear number two quarterback in this class. It's just more of a default conversation right now based upon there just not being a clear number two behind Beck. Yeah, I had an early third on Shadir Sanders. So uh, we, we see him pretty similarly. I, you know, I watched um, so I watched nine quarterbacks in, in prep for this episode. Most players, I watched three, maybe four games, uh, four if I felt like I really needed like one more game of sample to to get a clean look at them. Uh, with Shadur, I had I had watched three um, a while ago. I decided to go back and watch three more. And I, I was actually, I came away a little bit higher on him after this next sample that I watched because I had forgotten how uh, outstanding the Colorado State performance was, for example. Yeah. But like, it's it's the worst competition that he played, pretty much. Um, but you know, s- seeing some of those early season games, Colorado State, TCU, I get more like what people are so intrigued by with um, his his feel throwing over the middle of the field. You know, glance routes into tight windows against zone coverage. Uh, really like the the short to intermediate accuracy. I like how he protects the football. Um, and I, I was I think his arm strength, I still don't think is great by yeah. NFL standards, but I, I was probably underselling it a little bit initially. Um, yeah. To me, I just think that his uh, his strategy for dealing with pressure does not look like any quarterback that's ever been successful in the NFL. Um, and I, I get that he had a bad offensive line, but yeah. like you don't see good NFL quarterbacks turn around and run like five yards backwards to escape the pocket ever. Um, you know, even even Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen are a, a little bit smarter with it there. And so I think the pressure response um, just has has to improve. I think it's it's it, it doesn't even work against the better Pac-12 competition that he faced. Um, and I don't yeah. think he's athletic enough to get away with that in the NFL. Um, and then I, I also just think there's a bit of a ceiling limitation at his size. Um, you already see the height being a bit of an issue for him in college where he can't really see the field if he steps up in the pocket, uh, which is why he has to to leave from the back so often. Um, you know, still, I uh, still want him to be more decisive, uh, moving off of his first read. And I, I, there's, there's criticisms there, but I think processing from a clean pocket over the middle of the field is for the most part, a, a, a check mark for him. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's really a situation where like every game I watch from weeks one to five makes me like him more. And then every yeah. game after week five makes me like him less. So you, gotta you, see how it develops. You know what's weird about him, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, but so I think we see him very similarly from the ability to work against pressure, which when we talk about Jackson Dart, that's like one thing that I really kind of sold me on Jackson Dart was like his plan against pressure a little bit. But Shador Sanders, here's a question for you, James, right? Is that Carson Beck, who we just talked about, he 
also has some limitations working against pressure for different reasons, right? Because he just is a little statuesque. He's not the most fleet of foot of all time. Like he's a very pocket oriented quarterback, which is fine. You can win in the NFL that way. There's no doubt about it. But my question is, is that Georgia, he works from a lot less murky pockets consistently, right? Like there's a lot of clean protection. There's a lot of easy windows. There's a lot of, there's a lot of just more stable, I almost want to call it sustainability in the Georgia offense. Like you just kind of, it's more on schedule all the time. Shooter Sanders, the offense line is a problem, which is why they completely upgraded that unit this off season. There's no doubt about that. And I think that when he does have clean pockets, he's pretty brisk. Like he's pretty quick. I think he processes pretty well. I think what happened to him is the second half of the season, after they got off to like their 4 0 start or wherever that was, and they were playing good football in the beginning against bad competition, is that when things got murky, the pocket and both the results on the on the scoreboard, he really started rushing his process, which made his process actually slow down, right? Where he was just like he wasn't seeing the field correctly because he was pressing too much. There was too much hero ball, like he was doing too much. My question is for you is that. If you take both players, and we're going to do a little bit of transient property, which we shouldn't do, but we're going to do it here for a second, okay? If I throw Shador Sanders into the Georgia situation and I throw Carson Beck into the Colorado situation, how much does that narrative change? Yeah, I think that um, I think if you put Carson Beck in the Colorado situation, you would probably get um, slightly less good performances early in the year. Like I think that I do think that Shadur Sanders is is capable of of some things like under pressure working within twenty yards that Carson Beck is not. Um, I do think you would get a slightly higher floor uh, later in the season uh, with with, uh, with Carson Beck in uh, Colorado's offense. Um, right. So yeah, I, I see your point for sure, and I, I don't I don't um, want to undersell like how bad of a situation it was for Shadur Sanders. So I'm, I'm excited to see, like, hopefully the offensive line is at least passable this year to make it an easier evaluation. Um, right. But and, yeah, and I, I think it's key before we move on is that people out there that do their own scouting or just kind of learning and, and just are listening for information. This is summer scouting. So as we go into the season, open-mindedness, right? Because this is a clean slate at this point. Shador Sanders, if he is a completely different player in 2024 than he was in 2023, the evaluation changes. I think that that, and I think you talked about this our first episode, some people hold on to their priors way too much, where it's like their summer scouting thoughts is their thoughts throughout the entire process, and people don't concede that, like, guys get better, or guys can get worse, or guys can stagnate. I just want people to have an open-mindedness as they get into the 2024 season here very soon. Yeah, definitely an important point to mention. Um, so we wanted to talk about Drew Aller next, which um, we were going through uh, kind of the order before, and uh, you talked about how the NFL might be a lot higher on Drew Aller than um, media is. So uh, give me your rundown on Aller. So yeah, Aller is well-liked. I think it's the Blesto service actually has him as the quarterback one right now in the summer. And like, that's not the gospel, right? I mean, because Ble- I don't even want to go too deep into Blesto, but like there, there's some inconsistencies in Blesto that you shouldn't take the grades for gospel. Like you just shouldn't. But either way, some people in the NFL really like Drew Aller, And it's the reasons that we know that is typically the reasons, right? He's a big dude with an incredibly strong arm. I mean, he's a legit 6'4 plus. He's legit 240 pounds. He has a howitzer for an arm. I mean, he probably has just about the strongest arm in this class. I mean, there's other guys like Cameron Ward that's going to be at Miami now for Washington State that has a very strong arm. There's, you know, there's going to be some guys like that. Donovan Smith from uh, from Houston that was a Texas Tech transfer. He's got a very strong arm as well. But overall, Adler might have the most live arm of anybody in this class. So people look at that in a vacuum, and they also see last year in his first year of starter, at least on paper, he threw 25 touchdowns and only two interceptions. And in, in a first year of a starting quarterback, that looks pretty good, right? 25 to two is a hell of a like that's that that's a touchdown interception ratio if I've ever seen one, right? But right. then you see Drew Aller against the best competition that he played, right? In Ohio State and a couple other games where that's the closest thing you're going to give to NFL defense is the defenses that he played on the highest level in the Big Ten. And he was bad. Like he just played really poorly. I think that 
he's a guy that general accuracy and ball placement are an issue right now. And I think that a part of that is, is that his feet kind of get stuck on him a little bit when he's navigating the field and he's trying to find open pass lanes and he's going through reads. I think that his lower body really stagnates on him. So his lower and upper body did completely get disconnected at times, which really affects his ability to throw on time and accurately. I think that that is a huge issue for him. He needs to improve his feet this year. Like he needs to keep everything a lot more in line. He needs to keep things repetitive. He needs to keep things consistent all the way through from his base. I think his base is very inconsistent. I also think he's a pretty good athlete though. Like the building blocks are clearly there, but man, he's, he's just not that guy right now. Like, I mean, if you're projecting him in the first round or even the second round, maybe even the third round, I, it's just way too rich for my blood right now. Like I could see the world where we could come out after 2024 and say Drew Aller was the guy that made the ascension. Because every year there's a guy that we're not talking about or a guy that we're lower on that does make that ascension, which is why I say the open-mindedness. But right now, James, like he is just – he just isn't that guy right now. I mean, I don't know how else to, yeah. how else to say it. His accuracy and ball placement are not at a full standard. He is yeah. a flamethrower that doesn't have direction right now. He was a frustrating watch because there are – there are so many things to get you excited. There's absolutely something there. It's just, like you said, the accuracy is unplayable. Um, you, you mentioned the arm strength, you know, get ready to hear about prototypical size. Um, it's going to be the first line on every Drew Aller scouting report. Um, yep. His touch, he can stand in the pocket, get to his third read consistently. Had a, um, I think, 10.2% pressure to sack rate last year. Um, really like some of his pocket navigation and his ability to keep his eyes downfield while he's maneuvering pressure. So there's a lot of building blocks there for a starting, uh, you know, high quality NFL quarterback. Um, I was looking on sports info solutions, uh, at mm -hmm. their on target rate, which I, I feel like lines up with the tape pretty consistently. And, um, so out of 80 quarterbacks with at least 70 attempts, he had the second lowest on target rate on throws of 15 plus yards last year at 35.6%. And comparing him to some other quarterbacks over the last couple of years that have had accuracy problems, Anthony Richardson was at 54. Drake may was at 53.8. Uh, Michael Penix, 52.1 Joe Milton, 44.6. So like Anthony Richardson, who's, considered by the the general public as one of the least polished, least accurate quarterbacks to come out in the last few years, was it 20% higher on accuracy on throws of 15 plus yards down the field? Like he makes some, some really nice tight window throws, even in that Ohio state game, there were a couple, yeah. there's one uh, like touchdown at the end of the game. And then one like out to the left where he was kind of on his move, some big time throws for sure. But just, I mean, misses, I think he probably missed 10 or 11, you know, open throws in that Ohio State game. And, um, you know, I was going through his tape and I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I remember watching the Ohio State game live and thinking, man, Drew Aller sucks. Yeah. Um, maybe that, <laughs> maybe that's just, maybe this is an example where, you know, the, the small sample size that I saw on broadcast is, is skewing my opinion in one way, but no, like even his good games, uh, he's, he's still missing a ton of throws. So yeah, it, it's pretty simple with him, with him. He has to fix his footwork, get more accurate to even really be in consideration to get drafted. Like if he doesn't improve there, I, I don't think he should even come out. So, so here, so on my spreadsheets, I have my grades, I have my numerical, you know, just kind of it, what, what it portrays as far as round grades and, and what that means as far as projecting to a, you know, quality starter or a plus starter or a generational player, like whatever it might be. I didn't even grade Drew Aller. Like I watched four games. I have a very good understanding of Drew Aller, but I didn't want to put a grade on him because for me, he's a wait and see quarterback right, right. now. Like, I don't think he's a draft. I, I don't think he's a guy that should enter the 2025 NFL draft today based upon what I've seen. But I think the context is important, right? And this is the, the fair part of this evaluation is, he was a first-year starter, right? That's one. Two, he was in a pretty bad offensive system. Yep. I mean, like let's call it what it is, right? I mean, they literally they literally made a offensive coordinator change this offseason, but they had fired their offensive coordinator during the season this past year, right? So, like the offensive coordinator situation 
wasn't great. I also love that they brought in Andy, Andy Koltanicki, who is the former offensive coordinator of Kansas. I mean, that that's going to be fun, right? Because yeah. that dude is super innovative. He's very diverse. I think the run game is going to get going with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. I think that he's going to be able to make some a lot more a lot th- things a lot more easier on Drew Aller than they were a year ago, which I think will be great. Because if you look at what Kansas has done with Jalen Daniels and even Jason Bean the last two years when Daniels has been out, they've been pretty efficient quarterbacks for the most part, at least comparative to what their talent level says they are. So I'm excited to see him under a new offense coordinator. I'm excited to see him year two. The only big thing that I have issue with is that he doesn't have a great group of wide receivers coming back. I mean, the only guy that uh, worth mentioning on the last year's team was the Lambert Smith kid who ended up transferring to Auburn. Right. So like the, uh, yeah. the wide it's receiver Julian position, Fleming and like not much else. Yeah. Literally they got Julian Fleming and I, I like, I like Tyler Warren, the tight ends, but like, I mean, at the end of the day, we still need to create some plays in space. Right. And he's not that guy. He's a middle right. of the field, big body type of dude. So we need to see him be able to have a little bit more of ability to affect every area of the field than we saw last year, but I'm not sure if he has the wide receivers today to make that happen, but we'll see ultimately. Right. So he's a wait and see kid. Don't even have a grade on him. And I'm completely okay with that. Like he's not going to be in any quarterback ranking article for me this off season. He's literally going to be a blurb at the end that says I watched Drew Aller. I'm not comfortable grading Drew Aller right now because what you see physically is not what you see on film right now. So I'm waiting to see if 2024, we get a little bit more of those parallels coming together. Yeah. I had him as QB five, but I, I totally uh, actually agree with not even giving him a grade. Um, I'll, I'll toss it to you. If there's yeah. uh, you know, after that top three, is there the next quarterback that's, that's on your mind for this class? Yeah. I mean, right now I, I do. I like Jackson Dart a lot and I know we've talked about him a ton for me. Like there's this, really weird middle ground of quarterbacks after the first couple of Jackson Dart from Ole Miss that I just mentioned, Riley Leonard from Notre Dame, the transfer from Duke. Like, what does he look like with Mike Denbrock now as the offensive coordinator at Notre Dame? I think that's a very interesting conversation that you could have. Cameron Ward is another guy from Miami that started out as at incarnate word transferred to Washington state, did a lot of good things at Washington state, but now is down in Miami for his last year after he was potentially leaning to go into 2024 NFL draft, but ultimately opted to come back for his his final year here. But then there's even guys like Connor Wigman, who I know that you had in a first round mock, who obviously has building blocks to get super excited about. But for me right now, I'm in on Jackson Darts to about as much as I can be in on Jackson Dart because here's the here's the positives and then the issue that I have with Jackson. The positives: six two, verified, 217 pounds. Good NFL frame. He's going to hit thresholds that you want. He's going to be 6'2". He's going to be 220 plus pounds. Cool. Cool note on him. His dad played safety at Utah. And actually there was several different schools that were were recruiting him to play safety on the college on the college level. And if you watch his game, especially in 2022, a little bit more than 2023, the kid can move. Like he's a very functionally good athlete in the pocket, escaping the pocket. I think this kid's a nice athlete overall. And I think baseline, arm strength, and arm talent, I think that he's got good to plus in just about every aspect, right? Like he's got a flexible arm. He's got a flexible upper half. I think he throws with good pace and good zip on the football. I think he has some touch to his game as well. But here's the concern, James. Here's the concern. Ole Miss, love Lane Kiffin's offense for the college game, right? It's awesome. He schemes up so many cool stuff. Gets wide open throws. His run game is super diverse and super interesting and it's space oriented, but it's not super NFL centric, right? Right. So like the, the the concepts you're running, the plays in general that you're running, it's not super translatable to the NFL, which is the one reason that I do have slight pause with Jackson Dart. But if I'm just talking about physical body type, arm talent, athleticism, I think he has everything you need. I'm just really curious to see because 2022 is not very good. 2023 was pretty good. I'm excited to see if he takes another big jump in 2024 in his third year under the system. Let me ask you a question. So on on the scale of one to 10 with one being Tennessee under Josh Heupel and 10 being like um, Michigan's passing game from last year, like, you know, one to 10, as far as pro style, how would you rate the Ole Miss passing game? It's it's like a three. 
three or four, yeah, like okay. somewhere That's, in that yeah. bucket. Like it's it, it's low, man. It really is because it's not a pure gimmick. At- it's not, but it's just like it's just like a a, a wheel route, basically. Like yeah, it's it's very it's not air raid per se, but like it is air raid ish at least for outside receiver responsibility. Like a lot of vertically oriented stuff, a lot of pre snap. You know, either you're you're running an outside vertical or you're snapping it off to a hitch or a comeback. Like it's very yeah. easy centric outside. Right. So, and a lot of half field reads, which is, right. you know, not a death sentence, but like, I would like to see a guy work front side to backside dig occasionally. Right. And like, you just don't see that a ton in Lane Kiffin's offense, which is why I think it's a great college offense. I mean, the dude is an absolute genius on the college level, but I do have some pause. Like, I don't know if, you can't, I don't know if Jackson Dor can read a full field, which again, like a guy that's going to be a rookie in the NFL, I don't need him to be a full field reader right now. Like he still has time and there's still, you know, there's still acclimation that needs to happen to the NFL game. But like, yes, uh, on the scale of, cause it's not as bad as Hypo and that offense, although that offense is very fun again for the college game. It is like a three to four. Like there's some things that you can get through and there's some things that you can build off of, but it is not incredibly translatable to projecting quarterbacks to the next level. Another on target rate stat from Sports Info Solutions. Uh, Jackson Dart had the highest on target rate on goes and fades last year. Uh, 71%. And I, that, that's not just a cherry pick stat. I got through two games and I'm like, I don't think I've seen him miss a, a throw down the sideline. So I had to check it out. Um, but really like his accuracy outside of the hashes. I thought the touch was really impressive. And, um, I I started with that Penn state game, the bowl game that you recommended. And, uh, yeah, what he was able to do under pressure there was, was really impressive. Uh, just, you know, standing in the pocket, man, I did think sometimes, you know, when he gets interior pressure, he had had difficulties, uh, seeing over the pressure and, and targeting the middle of the field. Um, and I think, so for me, I gave him an early fourth round grade, so I am lower on him than you. And okay. um, there are two things that that I had an issue with. The first one you mentioned is the offense just making it a, a more difficult evaluation from a processing standpoint. Um, I was a little bit lower on his arm strength than I think you were, and it could it okay. it could just be a sample size thing from what games I watched. But um, the Texas A and M game, like there was a throw where he was on the move rolling out to his right and like had an open receiver in the end zone and skipped it about five yards short. And then mm-hmm. some other throws where uh, Trey Harris really had to work back to the football uh, on, on deep throws. But it, I mean, if Jackson dart ends up having a really good arm, then um, I could definitely see him in that second to, to late first round conversation. But from what I saw, I, I thought arm strength was a bit of a question. Okay, so so same question that you kind of asked me, just a different variable. So scale one to ten, one being uh, who is a really bad arm in the NFL. Um, Joe Burrow. Uh, jo- All right, yeah, we'll use Joe Burrow. Uh, Joe Burrow's Joe like Burrow. a two or three, but yeah, yeah, so Joe Burrow's a two or three. Maybe we'll say Gardner Minshew. I don't know, yeah, like Gardner Minshew one, one and Josh Allen being the ten. Right? Where is he on that scale for you, NFL arm strength wise? Yeah, I saw him. I saw him as like a Joe Burrow, um, maybe a maybe a point five ahead of Joe Burrow. So I give wow. him like a two point five okay. to three. Okay, all right. Yeah, I think that's a general because, like, if you ask me the same question, I would probably say like a five. Like, I actually think he's okay. like solid for NFL standards. I think he's about average. So I think that's our discrepancy right there. Is you're just and, a little bit lower on that upside from a ability to drive the football perspective. Yeah, and like evaluating arm strength when we get to you know the player's final season and I've watched every game of their tape, I'm going to have a lot more of a hard stance on that. When I watch three games, you know, it, it could just be that I didn't see their, their deepest throws and and there could be some, some throws that, you know, work counter to what I'm saying. So sure. um, yeah, interested, interested to see him. One, one takeaway I did have is I, I came away from watching Jackson dart a lot higher on Ole Miss for this season because yes. just as far as executing Lane Kiffin's offense, I think he can I think he could have a lights out season and like one of those um you know Heisman contender uh type of seasons regardless of what his NFL draft prospects are. I mean because um, he's got he's got so many weapons. I mean I know everyone yeah. talks about like him losing Quinshot Judkins, but you mentioned Trey Harris. He has the big tight ends coming back this year as well. 
They got Jordan Watkins coming back. Antoine Wells transferred in from yep. South Carolina, who was who was injured last year. So, like, there's a lot of weapons at Ole Miss this year, to say the least. For sure, for sure. Um, so I will. Uh, the next guy I want to talk about, I have yep. as my quarterback three, um, and it's a player that similar to the Drew Aller conversation. I'm not. I'm not even sure that I would draft him if he was in this class i mean i would at some point but it's really just if he fixes one thing i think he could be a, a top half of the first round guy and that's jalen milrow um so i think just from an athleticism and arm talent standpoint he he checks all of those boxes uh for me watching his tape last year i just thought he was so indecisive and like uh, saw things way too slow developing uh 10 plus yards down the field where it's yep. like you've you got to take a major step forward to really survive in the nfl but just from a pure potential lottery ticket standpoint i am pretty intrigued by what Jalen milrow could be you, you know what's really intriguing even more about him is that one i think you saw a lot of improvements down the stretch of the season like the first like three to four games. I mean, he literally got like quote unquote benched right. for a game because it was like, it's just not good. Right. And I think Nick Saban commented on the SEC media day where he was just like, we kind of had to have like a reality check with Jalen of like, Hey dude, like you need to, we need to step forward here or else like there needs to be a change. Like, I don't, I don't know what's happening here. So it was very interesting to see kind of the development down the stretch. The other thing I, I really, I mean, I felt like the offense opened up so much more down the stretch because I mean, Nick Saban also kind of verified this a little bit. The first few games, James, they were just kind of like, we want you to be a quarterback. So like, you're not going to run the ball a ton. Mm -hmm. Right. But like second half of the season, they're finally like, okay, take the shackles off. You can go run the football if you feel like, and then you see him and you're like, oh, that kid's, that kid's a really good athlete. I mean, he's about six foot two. He's about 220 pounds and he's four, four high type of athlete. Like, I mean, the kid can scoot, man. There's no doubt about it. So a lot of building blocks, I agree. I'm very interested because when I think of Kalen DeBoer quarterback, and I, I actually wrote an article about this, when I when I think of a Kalen DeBoer quarterback, and I w- did research all the way back to when he was at Sioux Falls, and I charted every quarterback that he's had since Sioux Falls up until this last year, this past year with Michael Penix at Washington, he's never really had anybody like Jalen Milrow before, right? Like this dynamic athlete that maybe – Short to intermediate, he's a little bit of a slow processor, but then he does have a really nice ability to stretch the field with the arm strength he has. I'm just more curious to see what happens this year because, like, there's Heisman odds going out. A lot of people like Jalen Milrow. A lot of people are putting money down on there. Kalen DeBoer has a great reputation as an offensive developer on the college level. I just don't really know what's going to happen there, man, because I think most people are just assuming that Jalen Milrow is going to take this massive step under DeBoer, and it could happen. Like, he very well could, but... If I asked you again, and not you specifically, but if I asked anybody out there, point to the quarterback that he's had that is like Jalen Milrow that he's had success with, there's no answer. I mean, this is – we're talking about like Jake Hayner and Michael Penix. Like, I mean, that, that's I, not, I agree with you, but yeah. like as an Indiana fan, you yep. know, I think people kind of undersell Michael Penix's athleticism early in his career. Um, you go back to that Penn State game, reaching out for the, uh, for the game-winning touchdown. Like he could – he could actually run and like he showed that at the combine, but as far as play style, he was not yeah. someone that's breaking out of the pocket. So I agree with right. your point. Uh, just had to, had to chime in. Um, I but no, I, I I'm with you. I think, um, yeah, I, I view Milro and Aller and kind of Wigman just based on a sample size as like the pure do you, lottery do you like tickets. Wigman? Do you like Wigman? I mean, I, feel I like yeah, I do. Yep, and okay. um, I have him as my quarterback too. Like I have okay. Carson Beck, Connor Wigman, Jalen Milrow, Shadur Sanders, and then Drew Aller as my top five. Um, Wigman, and like we, we talked about him some a couple episodes ago, it's just, it's it's a really small sample size, and um, he looked outstanding. I mean, throwing over the middle of the field, avoiding yep. pressure, the touch, the arm strength, ball security, I, I really think he checked every box, except he missed a couple of off-platform throws. Um, so I, I like everything he showed on tape, but small sample size, and it was against pretty bad competition. They played Miami, but then a, a couple um schools that I I can't even remember, uh, like New Mexico yeah. or New Mexico yeah, State. I, I, 
I'm trying to think back to the Miami game. He had like a boneheaded throw or two in that one. Like I, threw, I think he threw a couple interceptions against Miami, if I remember correctly, right? Like, okay, so yeah, he had he had I think he threw two interceptions last year, mm-hmm. um, and I remember watching them and thinking neither of them were his fault. One of them okay. I know looked like a boneheaded um, decision, but he. Um, he's throwing an in breaker and Evan Stewart tripped out of his break. So, uh, I think, uh, um, the safety, uh, Miami safety anyways, got a, a, a free interception off of that, uh, cause there was no receiver. And then the yeah. other one was like the end of the game, uh, fourth and long, just a, a heave into traffic. So I, was I it Cam see... Kitchens? Cam Kitchens? Yeah. Cam Kitchens. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, Connor Wigman's kind of just like, all right, I got to see, see you stay healthy for a full season and repeat what you showed on tape. But I don't really have too many uh, hot takes outside of that uh, on Wigman. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so like there's a couple quarterbacks that I kind of have on a wait and see list as well. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned, I'm a little bit wait and see with Aller. I'm also waiting to see with Riley Leonard from Notre Dame that transferred from Duke. I like he has all the variables. He's going to be six. He's a verified six three and five eighths, so he's going to be right around six foot four. He's two hundred fifteen plus pounds at this point. He ran last year for scouts four five two in the forty. So like this is a legitimately good athlete. I think his arm strength is slightly below average for NFL standards. Like I don't think it's a howitzer or anything, but I think his I think he's got good arm talents like he kind of has the ability to throw off platform and to throw with touch i mean he has those variables to him it's just it, last year at duke it was just so confined because they just had no wide receivers i thought created a bunch of separation so like everything was a tight window throw and he's not the court like he's not Aller. like he's not gonna be a guy that's gonna be able to fit every tight window necessary in that type of situation so i'm interested to see how he does he's one and the other one's cameron ward who's going down to miami i I'm he's a flamethrower, right? Like he's a hero ball dude. He holds the ball forever. He's got some bad pocket navigation things, but like, then there's other times where you see really nice athleticism and you see really nice arm strength and arm talents, but he's a little bit of a volatile kid right now. Like the highs are incredibly high. The lows are unplayable, right? So like, I think it's bridging the gap between being, the playmaker you are and raising the floor a little bit because if he's able to raise the floor substantially at Miami then I think that he's got a chance to be a riser it's just his his tape is just very volatile right now to say say the least right um the Washington game I think is a good encapsulation of that he had one of the best throws that I saw from any quarterback in this class uh resulted in an incompletion but it was in the red zone uh through like a deep post layered it over two defenders um back of the end zone bounced off his receiver's hands. And then very next play, he throws a sideline shot for a touchdown with perfect touch. His ability to layer throws on top of having a a quick release, I think is what was most impressive about him. Um, But yeah, just takes a lot of bad sacks, inconsistent decision-making. You've got fumbles. He's not that big. I, he's, he's like a creative um, he's creative when it comes to escaping pressure, but I didn't think he was a great athlete just in terms of pure escapability and being able to outrun defenders. Um, so yeah, he'll be, he'll be interesting. Definitely a player to watch uh, for sure. The only I, and then um, Riley Leonard, I watched a couple games of him early in the year. And then once it kind of became clear, he wasn't going to be in this class. I, uh, I wasn't paying attention to him as much. Yeah. Um, the, I think the last player to mention would be Quinn Ewers. Um, who I haven't watched since December. Uh, mm-hmm. Watched pretty much all of his tape from last year, um, and then he uh, declared, so I, I kind of removed him from my brain. But uh, I gave him a, a mid-third-round grade back in December. I yeah. remember him having erratic ball placement, erratic decision-making, but having a pretty good arm. Um, but I, I can't really like remember specific plays from him, so if you had any... Any detailed thoughts on Quinn Ewers? Well, Quinn Ewers from 2022 to 2023 was a much different quarterback. I thought he showed incredible improvement. And 2022 was a little bit, it was a little bit, it was a smaller sample size because he had played and then he got hurt. Did I say I watched his 2022 tape? I meant 2023. 
yeah. his most recent oh, no, no. season. Yeah. Oh no, I, I was just making the illustration okay. that like twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three, I thought he took a really big jump. Like I thought right. he was a much better player this past year than he was as a sophomore, but technically a freshman when you really think about it, because he was a kid that he reclassified in high school to be able to go to Ohio State for a year, but like that was just kind of a weird situation. I'll say this about Quinn. Quinn has about as much ability as anybody in this class to throw a ball off platform and to throw when his feet are not set and he's not connected. Like there is a really good, just his upper body flexibility and his arm, or he's got a lot of natural arm talent in that way. I don't love his process of avoiding pressure at times. I think he's a little bit erratic working out of pressure just in general. And for as live his arm is, short to intermediate, he just kind of doesn't. I want to phrase this the best way. A lot of his, a lot of his deep shots, he kind of hangs the ball up a little bit, and it will die on him a, a, a tad. Where you kind of just watch him, and you're like, "Does he like arm strength?" But I don't think it's an arm strength issue. I think it's just more a he just doesn't put enough pace on the ball, even when he's trying to push it down the field a little bit more. So like there is. A lot of arm strength, arm talent. I don't love the frame. He's a very thinly framed type of kid, and I think that his process is a little bad working out of structure. But if we're just talking about pure throwing the football, how it looks out of your hand, throwing with pace, he's got a lot of tools to work with. I just think he needs another ascension this year. Yep. Um, I All of the plays that are running through my mind on Quinn Ewers are just like uh, missed throws to A.D. Mitchell. So, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying there. 